Good afternoon. We're so pleased that you're joining us this afternoon for this Sunday's at Home program. Today's program is a conversation with author Dr. Keisha N. Blaine and historian Dr. Sherry M. Randolph about Dr. Blaine's newly released book, Until I Am Free, published by Beacon Press on October 5th. My name is Lori Ann Turgeson, and I serve as the Director of Education at the National Women's History Museum. For those of you who are with us for the first time, welcome. For those of you who have attended a Sundays at Home program before, welcome back and thank you for your continued support. We thank you for taking time out of your Sunday to be with us this afternoon. I'm joined today by author and scholar, Dr. Keisha Blaine. Dr. Blaine is an award-winning historian of the 20th century United States with broad interests and specializations in African-American history, the modern African diaspora, and women's and gender studies. She is an associate professor of history at the University of Pittsburgh and the president of the African American Intellectual History Society. She's also a columnist for MSNBC covering race, gender, and politics in historical and contemporary perspectives. She is currently a 2020-2021 fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard University. Dr. Blaine has published extensively on race, gender, and politics in both national and global perspectives. She's the author of the multi-prize winning book, Set the World on Fire, Black Nationalist Women and the Global Struggle for Freedom, and co-editor of To Turn the World Over, Black Women and Internationalism, New Perspectives on the Black Intellectual Tradition, and Charleston Syllabus, Readings on Race, Racism, and Race Violence. Her latest books are the number one New York Times bestseller, 400 Souls, A Community History of African America, 1619 to 2019, and Until I Am Free, Fannie Lou Hamer's Enduring Message to America, the book we'll be hearing more about today. You can follow her on Twitter at Keisha Blaine and on Instagram at Keisha N. Blaine. Also joining me today is a friend of the museum as well as a member of the NWHM Scholars Advisory Council, Dr. Sherry M. Randolph. Dr. Randolph is an Associate Professor of History at the Georgia Institute of Technology and the founder of the Black Feminist Think Tank. Formerly an associate professor of history and African American studies at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Randolph's book, Florence Flo Kennedy, The Life of a Black Feminist Radical, examines the connections between the Black power, civil rights, new left, and feminist movements. The former associate director of the Women's Research and Resource Center at Spelman College has received several grants and fellowships for her work, most recently being awarded fellowships from the University of Connecticut's Humanities Institute and Brown University's. Howard Foundation. Dr. Randolph is currently writing her second book, quote unquote, Bad Black Mothers, A History of Transgression. Now, before Sherry takes over the conversation, please allow me to go over a few housekeeping items. As always, this presentation is being recorded and will be available on the museum's website in the days following the event. Our guests will answer your questions after the conversation. So please use the chat feature for any comments that you have during the discussion and use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions that you may have. You may ask your questions at any time during the discussion. They will be answered at the end of the conversation. A little bit about Until I Am Free. Fannie Lou Hamer said, we have a long fight and this fight is not mine alone, but you are not free whether you are white or black until I am free. And until I am free, Dr. Blaine situates Fannie Lou Hamer as a key political thinker alongside leaders such as uh, excuse me, Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and Rosa Parks, and demonstrates how her ideas remain salient for a new generation of activists committed to dismantling systems of oppression in the United States and across the globe. A blend of social commentary, biography, and intellectual history, Until I Am Free is a manifesto for anyone committed to social justice. This book challenges us to listen to a working poor and disabled black woman activist and intellectual of the civil rights movement as we grapple with contemporary concerns around race, inequality, and social justice. Please join me in welcoming Drs. Blaine and Randolph to the screen. Thank you, Lori. That was a great introduction. Um, before I moderate a conversation between uh, myself and Dr. Blaine. I wanted to first thank Dr. Blaine for such a wonderful book um, that I really enjoyed and such a great addition to our conversations on what's going on in current uh, American politics. We talked about you perhaps opening up with mm -hmm. a bit of a reading and then we'll go from there. Yes, and thank you all for being here this afternoon. 
I'm going to read uh, just a, a short segment from uh, the fourth chapter of the book uh, entitled The Special Plight of Black Women. If you have the book, you're welcome to follow along with me. On page 64. Although Hamer never self-identified as a feminist, she was deeply committed to the empowerment of women in society, especially in the realm of electoral politics and grassroots organizing, and she did not condone patriarchy or male chauvinism. Hamer also applied a race and gender analysis to her personal and political experiences, emphasizing the intersecting forces that shape Black women's lives in the United States. Despite her valuable contributions to Black feminist politics, Hamer resisted the label of feminist, much like many other Black women of the period. Her resistance stemmed from a history of distrust. More often than not, white feminists sidelined Black women in the women's liberation movement of the 1960s and 70s. The distrust, therefore, did not evolve out of thin air. Writer Toni Morrison argued as much in a 1971 editorial aptly titled, What the Black Woman Thinks About Women's Lib. What do Black women feel about women's lib? She asked, distrust. It is white, therefore suspect. Morrison's remarks capture the general disconnect between Black women and mainstream feminist movements of the 20th century. Although many Black women were interested in the core principles of the women's liberation movement, especially the focus on expanding women's social, political, and economic rights, they rejected the movement's focus on dismantling patriarchy while ignoring racism. Moreover, Black women found their contributions to the movement and their specific concerns largely overlooked. As Morrison explained, quote, in spite of the fact that liberating movements in the black world have been catalysts for white feminism, too many movements and organizations have made deliberate overtures to enroll blacks and have ended up by rolling them, end quote. No doubt Hamer's refusal to embrace the term feminist or join the women's liberation movement reflects this history. Even more, it signaled Hamer's refusal to simply fall in line. She maintained her own views on women's rights, some of which aligns with the movement and many others that departed from it. Ultimately, Hamer's ideas on women and gender, even the most controversial ones, significantly strengthened the women's, the mainstream feminist movement of the 1960s and 70s. Her life provided a model for how women could effectively lead in society and resist patriarchy in all its manifestations. But even more, Hamer joined other Black women in centering race and class in discussions of women's rights and progress. Long before the term intersectionality entered common parlance, Hamer articulated ideas that helped to advance this political vision. She understood her life in intersectional terms and resisted anyone, including white feminists, who recognized gender oppression but failed to grapple with the intersecting dimensions of race and class in particular. For these reasons, Hamer was especially critical of the women's liberation movement, pointing to the erasure of black women's history and contributions. She used her voice and influence in these spaces to remind activists of the unique place of black women in American society. Her ideas and political activities ultimately provided a genealogy for intersectional thought and Black feminism and exemplify how individuals who resist the label feminists can still effectively shape feminist politics. Hamer's observations on gender and her own political activities helped to advance Black feminism in the United States, laying the groundwork for contemporary expressions of women's empowerment, much like the one articulated by Megan The Stallion. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And, you know, I think I'm gonna go to a question that I, I mean, cause this book deals with uh, her rather, actually rather short life, if you if you mm -hmm. think about it, her rather short life of activism, you know? Um, so, but I wanted to ask about this cause this is one thing that you focused a lot on. Uh, a central part of your analysis on Hamer for, focuses on racialized capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. um, from her political work in the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party to SNCC, to the Black cooperatives, even mm -hmm. 
in the late 1960s, um, I mean, the early 1960s with legalizing abortion, her view always centered uh, racialized capitalism. So could you talk, and every, I because I went through all of your chapters really thinking about what her pivots were and what you highlighted. Can you talk more about how that political perspective informed her work, that intersection of analysis? Right. So thank you so much. Um, one of the things that I try to emphasize uh, in the book, as you point out, is how much we have to talk about certainly race and gender, which, which are um, vital to this conversation, but also class. Um, it, it is, in fact, perhaps one of the most significant aspects of Hamer's life that somewhat distinguishes her from many of the, the well-known civil rights activists that we tend to focus on, um, and particularly you know, for those who may not know, because I don't want to assume that everyone knows this history, you know, Hamer, as I explained, uh, grew up as a sharecropper. She was born in a sharecropping family uh, in Mississippi in October um, 1917. And that experience of, of working as a sharecropper, you know, on, on um, a plantation in Mississippi, uh, essentially not having the um, the, the ability, the access to, to land ownership, having to rely heavily on um, you know, the, the white planter in this, in this particular context, and, and simply being trapped in, in the system of, of dependency and debt. All of these experiences were vital to shaping Hamer's political vision. Uh, and, and in fact, as you allude to, it's not until much later in life that she joined the movement. So, so she was working as a sharecropper effectively um, you know, she, she explains that she started, she was lured into a life of sharecropping at the age of six and began working as a sharecropper at that moment um, up until she joined the movement uh, in, in August of 1962, at, at which point she was already 44 years old. And so sharecropping ultimately shaped much of her life and, and then it, it informed her thinking whereby she needed to always talk about not only the exploitations that she that she experienced as a black woman living in the South during this period, but, but particularly as a working class black woman or, or even more accurately a working poor black woman. Um, and, and this was central to her analysis in trying to get not only white feminists as I, I just you know was talking about how she would you know speak to white feminists, but in particular, this was part of her analysis that she emphasized in, in, in the space with other black leaders um, with civil rights leaders who often came from more privileged backgrounds, you know, middle class, um, upper middle class, um, some, you know, one might even classify as elite too uh, in, in, in this particular context. And Hamer wanted always uh, to, to point out that the, the levels of exploitation that black women were experiencing um, had to factor in a class analysis, right? And, and to be clear, she, um, you know, her, the way she spoke about class is, is not necessarily uh, in, in the same vein of someone like Claudia Jones, you know, from, from the 1940s um, on the communist left. That's, that, that's not necessarily the way to think about Hamer centering class, but more so to, to emphasize that classism um, is, is also part of the, you know, is also one of the, the, the focal points that, 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 that Hamer wanted people to talk about and certainly to, to be part of a collective struggle to, to challenge it as much as racism, as much as sexism. Um, and, and, and all of that is, is deeply connected to her own experiences of, of being on, on these plantations and, and, and just experiencing the indignities of life um, doing, you know, all kinds of work. And as I talk about in the book, you know, even domestic work and, and just a range of different things she did on the plantation of which she had these interactions with white women in particular um, who didn't see her, right, in the same light, who, who, who didn't even see her um, as a sister. I mean, that's part of what she's arguing in, in standing before white feminists in the 60s and 70s is saying, we can't just talk about sisterhood because look at my experience uh, as a black woman, as a working pro black woman, which is indicative of the experiences of so many. Thank you. No, that I think that comparison between, between how Claudia Jones might speak of, but yet I think uh, Fannie Lou Hamer 
gave all of the examples. She's always uh, talking about people's lived experiences that navigate through all of that intersection. So you brought up something, you alluded to something that I thought was a really interesting point that I uh, was trying to work through and thinking about Fannie Lou Hamer because you raised so many questions. So you spoke about mm -hmm. her in your book as on one hand uh, dismissed because she was Southern, poor, mm -hmm. black, um, a farmer, you know, all the things that the civil rights movement is working for, she's actually dismissed by some of right. its leadership in key political moments, but yet and still, and we see this with the black women leaders that we do know of from the civil rights movement, yet and still, she's highly respected, not by the same, mm -hmm. uh, but they have to deal with her. They can't dismiss her, even though she's dismissed. She can't be dismissed. So how do you, uh, in her tell it like it is approach, everything that kind of elevates her too is because she's Southern, poor, Black woman. Yeah. So how do we reconcile that in her history? Yeah, that's a great question. And it, and it's, it, it remains a, a tension throughout um, because what's, you know, what I have always found remarkable about Hamer's story is that the, the very same aspects of her life that that uh, ultimately caused her to be marginalized in the movement and you know particularly you know as as a black woman as a disabled black activist you know from the south um from a poor background like all of these things set her apart in many ways um and and cause people to, to to push her out and and when i think about people broadly i'm thinking about just even how we remember the civil rights movement which is partly why i wanted to write this book i mean clearly um you know, standing on the shoulders of, of folks like, you know, um, Shana Kylie, who's written um, powerfully about um, Fannie Lou Hamer. And, uh, and yet, you know, even I think a lot has changed over the, over the years, but I think there is still a way in which we, we do talk about the civil rights movement in the mainstream as, as still a male dominated kind of narrative. And, uh, and even when we do center Black women, um, there's a way in which, you know, someone like Rosa Parks, you know, will, will be elevated to a larger extent, far more than, you know, Claudette Colvin. And, and of course, even in just making that comparison, I'm, I'm showing not just, you know, class dynamics, but to a large extent, we could talk about colorism. I mean, there's all of these layers to it. Um, but in terms of Hamer, what, what sets her apart um, and, and what, what, so ultimately what marginalizes her ends up being the very same things that then make her all the more powerful, right? Because she comes from a distinct, a different background than many of the leaders with whom she collaborated, there's a way in which I think people, people understood her, people connected with her. Uh, mm -hmm. And I thought about this, uh, even as she organized, you know, on the grassroots level, she would go and she would give these talks, people would listen to her uh, in a way that they wouldn't necessarily listen to other people because they could, they could truly relate they could connect to her experiences. Um, she would always point out, uh, you know, the, the truth of the matter. She would always point out um, just the, the way that, you know, that, that people, she would, she would point out everyday challenges that people were enduring in a way that I think made a difference. Um, and just to give you a, a quick example, because as we're talking, this, this example comes to mind. Uh, I talk about in the book when she's at the 1964 convention she has this interesting interaction. Um, she, well, there's a lot of skirmishes that I explained, lots of challenges there with, with several leaders. But, um, but there's a moment where she has this um, tense exchange with Adam Clayton Powell. Um, and this is a you know, prominent black politician, well-respected. Uh, and he, he ultimately, he's challenging Hamer at the convention. He disagrees with her approach. He disagrees with her stance on, on not compromising. And, uh, and he ultimately is, he's, he's making his point clear to her and she's not really accepting his stance. And so he says to her, you know, do you, do you know who I am? Um, and the question is, is a interesting one because it's, it's his way of saying like, do you understand, um, you know, my, my, I mean, not only my positioning, my experience, like I'm not just some ordinary person giving you advice. Like I am Adam Clayton Powell, like I'm talking to you from this position of authority, do you understand, do you know who I am? And she says, yes, I, ab I absolutely know who you are. And then she says, but how many bales of cotton have you picked? How many beatings have you taken? Um, and that's a moment that is just, I mean, it's, it, it stays with me because one, I, how many people have the courage uh, to, to speak, you know, to, to, uh, to, to figures, <laughs> you know, in authority that way, but it, but it shows you how Hamer's 
you know, her whole political vision was so grounded in the lived experience and the everyday. Uh, and, uh, and she was trying to get him to understand as much as she knew who he was and certainly respected all the things he had accomplished, he could not um, tell her what to do because he did not truly understand what she was going through as a black woman living in Mississippi, um, as a black woman having to endure beatings uh, as she attempted to uh, register to vote uh, and, and get others to register to vote. So, so I think uh, that you know, all of these interesting aspects of Hamer's life that we can talk about as marginalizing her within the larger narrative ends up being the things that make her stand out, that people recall, that people um, are moved by. Uh, and, and in effect, I think we're able to talk about Hamer today uh, because she stands out in all of these ways. So it's, a, it's an interesting tension, um, but I think um, it speaks to just the power of, of grassroots leadership. People may be different. They, have, they come from different backgrounds. They approach things differently, um, but we have, to, we have to give them the space to lead, we have to give them uh, the space to, to do what works for them um, that can be you know, most impactful, even when we think we have all the answers. So I, I just, there's so much we can learn from that story. There's something you said at the end that actually made me think you said uh, the power of grassroots leadership, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the power of, so I wondered about this and thinking about women's leadership in general, her age being older than most of the people in SNCC right? Mm -hmm. Or most of the young people in SNCC, because we know that there were other right. people in SNCC just like her. Um, but she she rises to leadership, right? Mm -hmm. she, she becomes central, speaking so many things that she does. And so many people respect her, right? Um, right. And so I, I wondered about that, but I think maybe you could say more about the power of SNCC in promoting a type of grassroots leadership that makes her important yeah. is that why you know or is that one of the reasons yes mm -hmm. absolutely um and and one of the women who hamer talks about you know as someone she deeply admires who's a mentor to her is ella baker and ella baker um just being the remarkable visionary behind SNCC, you know the student nonviolent coordinating committee uh, for those who might not be familiar and this is an interracial civil rights organization that plays such a pivotal role um in the expansion of black political rights uh you know certainly in the state of Mississippi, it's impossible to even talk about um, the, the movement for voting rights without SNCC, as is true throughout the US South. But, um, you know, there's a moment where, so there's two things I'll say. So one, Hamer, the way that Hamer talks about SNCC is interesting to me because she kept, and she kept saying, you know, when I met these activists, uh, when I met folks like, you know, Bob Moses, and, you know, this, this was the first time that anyone listened to me the first time anyone took me seriously. She would say that, um, which really stayed with me. And, and then she would draw this contrast to the NAACP, uh, which as I, as I argue in the book, I, I, I tried to, to tease out a bit because Hamer was very critical of the NAACP. You know, she saw the NAACP as elitist. I mean, these are, these are not new kinds of um, critiques that, that I think we, we see throughout history at various moments. So she saw them as, as very leaders. She also saw them as not necessarily being focused on grassroots leadership. And as I explained in the book, um, I, I you know the critique is is important, but I but I also you know point out that Hamer does not account for a lot of the diversity of leadership in the in the NAACP, including in the state of Mississippi. Uh, so so there's a lot more to you know to the story than just the, the way she frames it. But the way she frames it is still significant in getting us to see what can often be these class divisions uh, in the in the movement. Uh, and, and also, I think what she's particularly hinting at is more so what we can talk about uh, today, you know, through the work of Charles Payne, who's written, you know, remarkably on this uh, in I've Got the Light of Freedom, on the differences between the mobilizing tradition and the organizing tradition. And, 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 and so what Hamer is saying is, what she appreciated most about SNCC is the way that they came into communities, really worked with people. I mean, it was a slower process. It was about the development of local leaders. It was about this, you know, door-to-door -door canvassing. You know, it was a, it was, it was not the, the, you know, quote unquote glamorous kind of, um, you know, political organizing whereby you might have something like the March on Washington. You know, where the cameras are there and people are mobilized and. You know, um, everyone's tuned in, and 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 to be clear, I'm not dismissing that because it's you know as we can tell from the way that 
um, things have developed historically, you, you need all of that and more, you know, to, to dismantle systems of oppression. But, but for Hamer, she so appreciated uh, the approach from SNCC, which she felt gave room uh, for her to emerge. Uh, and, and she saw the NAACP and, and, and other similar groups as kind of imposing, you know, bringing in the leader into the space and saying, this is the person who's going to tell you what to do. And this is the person you need to, you need to answer to as opposed to saying, okay, we're here with resources, we're, we're coming into the community, we're going to, you know, we're going to share whatever knowledge we have in order to empower you to, to, to move forward and, and to lead the way you know how best to lead. So she argued that there would never be a Fannie Lou Hamer were it not for SNCC. She truly, truly um, loved and adored uh, the activists with whom she worked. And as you point out, many of them were, were much younger, uh, folks like Bob Moses, who I just uh, mentioned, um, you know, John Lewis and, and so many others. But uh, ultimately, I think the, the critique gets us to, to think about the differences of, of approaches to leadership, as well as the resistance to this charismatic male kind of leadership model, which we still grapple with to this very day. No, definitely. So can I ask, so that you, you alluded to that, because um, you bring up, you connect this book and even the title, you know, the title of the book, mm -hmm. Benny Hamer's Enduring Message to America. So, so yeah. what, so what, what is her message to America that we can bring forward? Yeah. So I've been thinking a lot about this and, uh, and one of the reasons why I wanted to, to go with this title in particular was, uh, you know, there's so many catchy phrases uh, that Hamer used and, you know, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, uh, which people use all the time. Uh, for me, this this notion of nobody's free until everybody's free is something that I find so powerful. Um, and and in the and in the other framing and way that I use it in the title of the book is whether you are black or white, you are not free until I am free. Is to push people to think um, of the collective. So so it is on the one hand a message about unity, but it's not so much. So yes, it is about unity about people working together, but more to the point, it's about getting everyone, uh, and I'm talking about it within the US context because that's often how Hamer would, would, would frame it, even though I think this is a, a message that certainly transcends you know, the, the nation state kind of framework. Um, and it's about understanding that one person's um, you know, life experiences you know, may, may certainly be unique. I mean, we, we all have our differences, that's clear. But there's a way in which our fates are connected because we are part of this nation. Um, and, and if we are connected and if we see ourselves as connected, it means that we don't simply um, lend a hand and we don't simply uh, you know, be, you know, we don't simply uh, make the decision to be part of the process to make this nation better just because it, uh, it, it, it may or may not you know, um, directly tie into our experience. So, so what I mean is, you you have to be concerned about the person next to you and 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 so Hamer was arguing that you can't experience true liberation uh, if another person is in chains because because we are connected uh, and um, and, we, and if we see ourselves through that lens uh, then, then I think it, it it compels us to act it compels us to be concerned when we see that certain groups don't have certain rights and privileges uh, even if we have those rights and privileges so I wanted this message uh, to 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 go forth and um and, and I was thinking a lot about it as I explained in the last chapter, you know when um you know now Vice President uh, Kamala Harris uh, gave the acceptance speech you know in which she referenced Hamer and 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 it was a similar you know message at a moment where we were and still are um, divided as a nation uh, of course in the context of COVID nineteen just dealing with a lot of, of grief. Um, and pain and, and still dealing with that now. And, uh, and trying, I think, you know, Harris was trying to, to say, despite all of the differences, despite all of the, um, you know, the, 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 the kind of upheavals we've been dealing with as a nation, we have to come together. And, and she evoked Hamer's words in that context. Uh, and I thought that was a message that was worth to emphasize to all of us that, you know, whether you're white or black, um, you are not free, you know, until I'm free. And uh, and of course, you you know this, um, Professor Randolph, because your work speaks so beautifully to this. Uh, but it also, you know, takes me back. It was immediately it took me back to the Kambahi River Collective, um, 
and a, a line um, in their uh, statement uh, in 77 that I that I had you know heard of over and over again, but I think hearing going back to Hamer made me see those those powerful links. Uh, and and so the, the line from the Kambahi uh, River Collective um, is quote: "If black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free, since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all the systems of oppression." I mean, powerfully capture and capture you know encapsulating what what Hamer was arguing. Um, you know, much earlier, but still uh, so, so deeply tied to this vision. So do you think that, I mean, I have so many questions. Um, <laughs> do you think that's uh, why you said uh, her message is to America, but mm -hmm. you, I think the, the chapter that you have on her internationalism, yeah. and, you know, that's all you, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, I read your footnotes carefully in that, that's, that's, I was like, did she start with this chapter? And then, you know, uh, that is, it's a lot of original research, a lot of uh, interesting questions and made me think about her differently. And I agree with Robin Kelly, who, who blurbed the book and said, mm -hmm. you know, we start to see Fannie Lou Hamer. And I hope some yeah. graduate student listening yeah. to this, like that's <laughs> another book that needs to be written about her, like yeah. her international yeah. Uh, elements and it also borrows from I, I could see your thinking from your first book do you know yeah. like law was was there and I have other questions about that but can you talk a little about her international uh way of seeing the world mm -hmm. and politics yeah yes you're absolutely right um I had to sort of restrain myself uh which <laughs> I because I because I, I think I I probably in the back of my mind probably wanted to write a book about family and internationalism but but this is what I, you know, to be honest, right? But but this is what I knew. I mean, I knew, um, and and this is it's so. I mean, as you read her, as you read about her life, I mean, just even going going through the archives, going through um, her speeches, it, it is so important to to ground to her within the national context as well as the Mississippi freedom struggle. So um, I, I wanted to make sure that I that I did not. I wanted to make sure that I that I was true, you know, to, to the history as much as possible. And I didn't kind of, you know, let my own um, interest, you know, veer me too far from the center. But I was thrilled, you know, when I came across an article um, of which Hamer said, which I had not seen before. I mean, I had not, you know, had not uh, encountered it until writing the book in which she said, I'm, I'm not fighting for, for civil rights, I'm fighting for human rights. And I thought, oh, this is so great uh, because it, it opened up a window for me. And, and then I started stepping back and looking at her earlier speeches um, before 1964, before, um, before September and October of 1964, when, you know, which is when she travels to, to Guinea on the African continent, uh, and then started to, to take a look at, at how she would draw parallels you know, to, um, to what's taking place in Africa, for example. I was thrilled, you know, in the process of doing research to find her signing all kinds of interesting petitions, um, standing with anti-colonialists. I mean, just all kinds of certainly very new um, material for me. And, and, and I was really happy that I could push through a chapter. Uh, and you're, you're, you are so correct, because when I wrote it, I said, I, I, I hope I inspire someone uh, because I, I, I don't think I will write it. But I, I said, I hope I inspire someone to take this and, and go to the next level and 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 delve deeper into um into this narrative of, of Hamer as a, as not solely a, a civil rights activist but a human rights activist which she certainly was um but this helped me i think because for example um you know Hamer was so critical of the you know the vietnam war exactly. and i didn't realize right until the process of doing the research of the book uh that she you know, she spoke out at much earlier than so many of her contemporaries, who who were certainly against the war, but but also very cautious about when they would speak out publicly because they were thinking about all of these concerns. Uh, and and Hamer I mean, just always throwing caution to the wind, uh, just condemned it very early, didn't hesitate because she saw the contradictions. Um, you know, drew the parallels between what was taking place in Mississippi and the Congo. I mean, just all of these interesting moments in her life where you could see the the way that um, global developments were were to a large extent uh, informing her political um, ideas and, and praxis and and also her her encounter 
um, and you know collaboration with Malcolm X. I mean that was that was key. That this was a moment that, that I think forced her to begin moving in new directions. And so so that to me was um, really great. And I I I, I you know, as you point out, I was so enthralled with this and uh, needed to make sure that I, I gave um, you know some context about this without making sure that I didn't you know lose sight of of how important Mississippi was um, for Hamer as she framed her analysis, you know, how important the, you know, just being in the Mississippi Delta was vital to, to her perspective. Uh, and as much as we do see these, these important internationalist themes throughout her speeches. Yeah. No, I, I really enjoyed that chapter and we'll sign it and we'll sign you know, there's just that part of the book, especially, it really resonated with me. And I think the overall message in the book, like, what can we take from this? Um, and also your message about Black women's, really, she's she's an intellectual trying the clothes on of, you know, like the Vietnam War, that doesn't make sense. This is why, do you right, know? Right. And so I, I found that just really incredibly compelling. Um, I have so many questions. And her, her stance on empire and imperialism, like she's an intellectual. Yeah sharpening throughout time. Um, so the thing that I, people who are listening, hopefully there's some young activists listening, I wanted you to talk a little bit about her cooperatives, because I think even people, a lot of, you know, other people who've written biographies on her have talked about the cooperative, but I like that you spent so much time connecting it to yeah. her, the politics that were also going on at the time and really enlarging that yeah. chapter. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of, and it also comes after SNCC, you know, it's what she's exactly. doing. So. Yes, and, and let me give another shout out to, um, I think I, this is sort of a side, a side comment, but I think an important one, one of the things that I am um, truly grateful for is that I get to write uh, history at a moment when I mean, there's just so much remarkable scholarship, you know, yours included, written by um, just amazing Black women historians and scholars. Like, it just so I have to give a shout out to Monica White, whose mm -hmm. book Freedom Farmers is just amazing in um, in centering Fannie Lou Hamer's work uh, with the cooperative, as well as uh, and, and and she focuses on a range of other key figures. But 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 I have to to say that that book was amazing and and helped me see. Um, how important this aspect of Hamer's uh, political career was. And, and so just so for context, uh, for those who are listening in the late 1960s, Hamer opened up uh, Freedom Farm uh, in Mississippi. This was her practical attempt uh, to um, deal with the problem of poverty and hunger uh, in the Mississippi Delta. But, but I would say to, uh, she, you know, she certainly was thinking about poverty and hunger at a national level. And um, this was, an opportunity for people locally to, you know, people would would, would pay a small fee, estimated $1 a month, like it was not, um, you know, it was not meant to be a, a burden financially on, on anyone. And you could be part of the cooperative, you could, um, you could, you know, benefit certainly from the crops that are being grown, uh, you know, uh, on the farm, you could ev even live on the farm, you know, Hamer provided a housing, she also provided job opportunities, uh, and she was able to do this uh, through through multiple means, but primarily through fundraising. She, you know, traveled across the country. She wrote letters, asked people uh, to help her uh, purchase the land, you know, in, in order to make this possible. Uh, and it becomes, uh, I just, I think, a powerful way to to see what one might think of as an expression of of black. Um, you know, economic self-sufficiency and, and you sort of see, uh, you know, that, you know, I work on uh, black internationalism as well as nationalism. So I, I saw uh, in, in this particular example, um, just the threats to, to black nationalist thought and, and the way that black people needed yeah. to come up with strategies, right? To, to uh, devise, you know, um, for themselves a path forward. And all of this is happening at a moment where you know, there are supposed to be uh, all of these government programs, um, you know, through the Great Society that, that are meant to address poverty and hunger and all of these things, but, but the people who need the help the most are not actually getting the help. And Hamer comes up with this, um, I think, genius response to addressing the poverty, you know, and, and the hunger in Mississippi, and, and then being able um, to, to, I think, 
just help people to support people, um, which as an aside, uh, well, it's connected. It's not, um, it is connected. There's a statement that she makes um, to Dorothy Hyde that I'll pull up as we were just talking, which which has stayed with me, but, it, but it's about how she emphasized how food um, was a political weapon and how people who ultimately didn't have a means, right, to take care of themselves, how they were always subject to, to white people in, in this context, and they were disempowered. And, and, and for her, Freedom Farm was not just a, a response to addressing poverty. Um, and, and so, yes, there is an economic justice focus, but it was also a political response as well. That, to me, I think um, is so valuable in, in thinking about how Hamer connected all of her work. No, and I thought, and we'll, we're going to open it up to questions soon, but that's what I was hoping you would also say that it was, especially this is the Black power self-determination yeah. moment, and you right. see someone who doesn't, and you know, doesn't take on that label, isn't it, doesn't turn to SNCC and stay in SNCC as a nationalist, mm -hmm. who is actually practicing, you know, this, you know, that ethic you know that politics because it makes sense do you know what i mean like in the right. south people yeah. need their independence from white supremacy or they can't be politically active and they can't eat so i thought i mean i thought that was i was taking all of your messages of what can we move forward in this political moment and that is still important even from someone who doesn't embody all of those politics you know exactly yeah and thank so, you for pointing that out too um <laughs> Yeah, yes. because I, um, and th you know, that part of Hamer's story, I think is, uh, I find so valuable and, and it's a lesson, I think, for today, just the way that she, so she did not, you know, a lot of people have said to me, oh, do you think she's a Black nationalist? Because, you know, they know I've written on Black nationalist women. And, and I said, no, she's, she was not a Black nationalist. I mean, clearly we can see the influence of Black nationalist thought. I think that's clear. But, uh, but she was not a Black nationalist. But what I love about her story is that she did not condemn Black nationalists. She um, she respected, she listened, uh, she held her position, but but she was never the kind of leader who said, oh, let's, you know, let's dismiss Stokely Carmichael because, you know, he's 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 moving in these directions or, or let's speak negatively about someone else. She was just like, no, um, ultimately, as I alluded to earlier, you, you, you are going to need different um, tools and responses, right? How do you dismantle systems of oppression a hundred different ways? And so it's not just, you know, oh, well, this is the only way you have to answer it. It's the only thing you must do. And um, so I appreciated that aspect of her philosophy. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I, I really enjoyed that aspect of the book. Lorianne, I can, uh, I see if you wanted to open up questions, I can uh, help field them. You don't have to jump on it. Will they just pop up? Uh, and also, Keisha, can you see them too? Should I read? I'll read yes, them so yes. the audience can hear them. I'll read them so the audience uh, can hear them because you guys don't see our screen. So does anyone have questions? Because uh, I have a million more I could keep asking. I'm mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and actually I just see, I see one that just popped up. Um, oh, you do? Okay, oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm on another page. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Wait, hold up, okay. let me go. Yeah, you Sorry, she, do you see them? Um, yes, yes, yeah. I was looking at the wrong. Uh, okay, I'll read the question from, from Jordan. Uh, or should I say the people's names? <laughs> okay, so the question is, you per, how do you personally feel about the impact of modern day? And what do you think is the largest con contribution? Uh, I'm thinking she's talking about her largest contribution to furthering the voices of Black women. So again, it gets back to the beginning part of your talk. Um, mm -hmm. And from a gender perspective, I, I right. Um, so there's several things that that I would say. You know, I was. I mean, part of why I wrote the book was I wanted uh, everyone to 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 listen to Fannie Hamer because I, you know, I there was a moment, uh, especially last year, during the uprisings where um, I, I felt so, so discouraged, as I'm sure many of us did, you know, watching how George Floyd died, and then even and then finding out later, you know, finding out about Breonna Taylor, which, you know, many people did not even know about until, you know, sort of the, the, the weeks after the George Floyd, uh, you know, killing and, uh, and so many other, I mean, it just, I just gave two examples, but, you know, Tony McDade, you know, just, uh, it, it felt like um, such a, a difficult, 
some spring and summer. And I remember just the feeling of, of hopelessness too. And, and, and asking myself, like, when are we ever going to change things in this country? Like, you know, when, when are we ever going to, what, what will be the moment? And, and I reflected just even years, well, many years earlier, but I thought about this, um, you know, grew up um, mostly in Brooklyn. And I remember just the, the narrative, of, of, you know, around Amadou Diallo and, and, and there's a sense that, okay, that was the moment things were going to change. Yeah. Um, and, and yet I was feeling again, you know, many years later, here we are, um, not much has changed. Uh, but what I, what I thought about was how, A, how Hamer managed to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. We're talking about a woman who had, who experienced a whole lot of violence, um, a whole lot of indignities, you know, from a forced sterilization, you know, we didn't talk about it, but, you know, I think most people know about the painful experience she had, you know, a white doctor removing her uterus without her knowledge in 61. Uh, you know, her, her experiencing um, a brutal beating in Winona in 63, um, you know, attempted assassinations. I mean, all, all kinds of things that she endured simply because she was trying to hold the nation up to its ideals and say, you um, claim that this is a, you know, supposed to be an inclusive democracy according to the constitution, then, then, all right, then give black people um, what is theirs already. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I thought about what it must have felt like for all of these activists, you know, in, in the 1960s to be pushing, I mean, just even in the years leading up to the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to figure out where the source of strength and where, where the, you know, um, the drive to keep pushing and pushing and pushing, even in the face of so, so much terror and violence, where it came from and, and, and what we might be able to draw from that history. And, and, and what I realized was that we, we needed Hamer's story. We needed Hamer's story because it was clear to me that, um, it, you know, if we're not careful, we will have, a sense of hopelessness where we where we step back and say, okay, things are are so difficult. We're not we're not we, you know we're not seemingly making progress. Or if we do make progress, we, we're sort of moving forward, but making four steps backward, et cetera. Um, you know how how do we keep pushing? Well, Hamer's story I think is an important one. In '64, she she walked away from the DNC, defeated. She did not leave with what she wanted. A year later. Mm -hmm. the, the Voting Rights Act was passed. Um, the next convention that followed, um, you know, uh, in 68 looked very different than the one in 64 because of Hamer's testimony, her voice um, and, and her story. And, uh, and, and the point is, there was no way she could know that in August of 64, right? There was no way she could know in August of 64 that a year later that there would be this monumental, I mean, very important, um, you know, tangible, uh, you know, step toward uh, ex expanding black political rights. Uh, she could have given up in August of, of 64. And yet it was just around the corner. So my point is, you know, there's no way to know. Um, we don't have, we, we don't have the foresight. So we don't, we don't know if we're two months away from some radical change or if we're two years away, if we're 20 years away, we just don't know. So the only thing left to do is to keep pushing, to keep pushing and keep pushing until it breaks. And I think Hamer's story um, uh, is, is one we need to know to, so that we don't give up in the fight. Um, and, uh, and, and so that is certainly part of the legacy is, is centering her life, her voice and, and her experiences uh, to, to propel us to keep pushing. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, that was, I think that was a great answer to the question. I think you, you show that everyone should get the book, you show that and the cooperatives, the organizing, like everything she running for political office, she used, you know, a hammer, a paintbrush, you know, a little sword, she used everything. So I think you really demonstrate that for, for an audience who needs to hear it. Uh, someone asked the question, okay. I'm, I'm figuring this out. Don't worry, Lorianne. Uh, someone asked the question about, uh, they came on late, but they wanted to know if Flo and Fannie Lou Hamer ever crossed paths. And yes, and it's actually in yeah. 
Yeah, yeah they, they crossed past uh, the summer of 1964. Uh, mm -hmm. Flo Kennedy was in Wednesdays in Mississippi and came down to Mississippi for Wednesdays in Mississippi, just for people who don't know, there's actually a lot of work coming out in a documentary. Uh, women, middle-class women would come down from New York, New Jersey, come down to Mississippi or in Alabama to negotiate, talk with, see what was going on in the summer of 64. And many mm -hmm. of the women felt, and I, you know, I didn't, I didn't put this in my book, but I often say it in lectures, uh, many of the, the uh, Northern women wanted Southern women, especially say Southern uh, women who were staunchly racist, who didn't believe that uh, Black people were worth anything. They actually wanted them to pick up the phone and say, hey, I heard, you know, your son was killed mm -hmm. or beat up and I'm just calling you mom to mom and uh, here, here's my word. That's it. Do you know, and they really just they were in the beginning just forming those kind of small but huge connections because women from the north were sending black and white women were sending their their children down to the south and rightly so were afraid for them. So Flo met right. Fannie yeah. Lou Hamer then, and she uh, what's so interesting is because I always find this so interesting because no one you know, in this moment, people know of Flo, but she was highly known in her historical moment. Uh, mm -hmm. She would bring up in the 60s about Fannie Lou Hamer. She was like, you know who you should invite? <laughs> this woman, Fannie Lou Hamer. Mm -hmm. And then and, and feminists would be like, no, I don't. <laughs> so even when she was already in the DNC, in her historical moment, people were still very dismissive of Fannie Lou Hamer yeah. because she was always bringing her up and Queen Mother more. And people were like, oh, I don't know who they are. And so she was like, no, she's really doing a lot of things. She's bringing up these cooperatives. She's She was sterilized. She would list mm -hmm. all the things that she symbolized and is working against. And she was still very much didn't fit what people thought. So yes, they yeah. they met briefly and had signed things and worked together again. But yes, so yeah, hope that answers the questions. I don't see any other questions. Am I looking correctly? You're looking correctly. I, I don't see any um, more that have been submitted from the audience, but um, we have a question, we being the museum staff that we like okay. to, to ask, ask of every guest that we have. And it takes different forms and you've kind of answered it, which is, uh, you know, what, what takeaway would you like this audience to leave with? I think you've said it loud and clear numerous times, but what call to action would you leave this audience with? Would you issue for this audience? So absolutely, uh, to just to reiterate, uh, to, to, keep, to keep fighting, to keep pushing, um, and I feel a sense of urgency, as I'm sure we all do now, because you know, when when I started writing the book, this was already several years um, after the. Um, so to be clear, the Voting Rights Act has been under attack for a long time. So we know this. This is not new. At the same time, the Shelby decision, I mm -hmm. think, was the moment where. Uh, we, you know, sort of as a nation had to, to wake up and say, okay, we have to be careful here because it's one thing to celebrate a win um, and, and it's another thing to protect that win. And, and since the Shelby case, you know, we're talking since 2013, I, I mean, I have lost track, but it, I was, you know, just keeping initially just making a list of all of these attempts uh, to, to, to curtail voting rights. Um, happening all across the nation statewide i mean it's just you know places uh, you know in 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 places like texas for example and and i thought this is so this is so troubling because we've we've celebrated right the voting rights act uh, it, it made a huge difference it absolutely did i talk about in the book if you just look at the the numbers uh, it made a difference uh, and yet we are at risk right of seeing though all of the work um sidetracked and we're seeing you know efforts to to curtail those rights so so we have to keep fighting uh, um and you know Fannie Lou Hamer's story I, I hope will will uh, inspire all of us to to keep pushing and that's just one example I mean you know wow just we we know what has happened even concerning reproductive rights I mean just so many so many challenges of late um that that we have to 
be mindful that you can celebrate a win, but you cannot turn away. You, you have to protect whatever gains uh, that you've made. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, Sherry, anything you want to add? No, I, there's so many questions I have, but I'll just email them to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, well, thank you. you. And thank you again for everyone for joining us here today. Just a reminder that this program today was recorded and it'll be available on the museum's website later this week. And if you enjoyed today's program, please join us on Sunday, December 5th at 3 p.m., when NWHM pre-doctoral research fellow in gender studies, Emma Rothberg, will provide a guest curator-led virtual tour of the newly published online exhibit, Feminism, the Fourth Wave. For a full, excuse me, for a full list of upcoming programs and for registration information, please visit the Sundays at Home landing page under the Public Programs tab at womenshistory.org. All of our events are always free, but advanced registration is required. I want to thank both uh, Dr. Blaine and Dr. Randolph for joining us today for this very important conversation. Dr. Blaine, thank you very much for this important book and its message. Until next time we meet, please everyone have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>